Hello and welcome to Live Questions. I'm Bill Harris, your host. Without a doubt, there is uh, quite a lot of uncertainty in this day and time, and people want answers. Well, we at he TV44 know you do because we have a list of viewer questions about life that you have sent us. So we've asked a group of local ministers to carefully review them and conduct some biblical research for answers. Well, today they're here with their findings, and I'd like for you to meet them. To begin, we have Pastor Neil Whitney of the church at Allentown, followed by Pastor Tyler Perry of Anastasis Church in Lima. Then there's Pastor John Hayward of Grace Community Church, also in Lima. And rounding off our panel today, Pastor Rick Lamb of Hume United Methodist Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all back for another round of discussion. Enjoyed it last week, by the way. Very good. To begin, we have a viewer question that asks, was the earth formed in a literal six days? Some churches preach this idea, but others say it was many, many more days than six, maybe even thousands or millions of years. What would you have to say, Pastor? I would say yes. The earth yes. was created in six okay. days. <laughs> um, it's uh, the word of God. It's the cornerstone of the whole Bible. You know, the very first verse says that God spoke it into existence and, and in six days he amplified on that. And, uh, um, and it, um, it's one of those things that um, I've believed for a long time and, um, and then it got confirmed to me. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that show that the earth is not as old as we used to think. Um, the moon, for example, is moving away from the earth at an inch a year. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, an mm -hmm. inch a year. And, and, um, and if we extrapolate back to where the moon was as close as it could be to the earth without being sucked into our orbit, mm -hmm. uh, it would be about 6,000 years. Hmm. So uh, that's one example. There's a lot of other examples. Um, People ask about the word day and ask whether that is, can be flexible. And the only place that people want to see the day be other than 24 hours is in the first chapter of Genesis. Everywhere else, they understand it to be a 24-hour day. Mm -hmm. Now, in the rest of the Bible, when we look at yom, the word day in Hebrew... Uh, if it's with a number, it's an ordinary day. If it's, worth, if, if it's connected with uh, morning, it's an ordinary day. If it's uh, connected with evening, it's an ordinary day. Or if it's connected with morning and evening, it's an ordinary 24-hour day. In Genesis, we see day with the first day, the second day, the third day, morning and evening is the first day. So we see all of those components. It's as if God anticipated the argument uh, before it ever existed mm -hmm. so that he could make the uh, argument in favor of a 24-hour day. Interesting. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that? Well, this has certainly been a debated topic over the history of the church. No and, kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And, and the six-day view is, is a very common view um, and could very well be the right view. Um, but I think careful Bible scholars who, who absolutely believe God's word is true would come to a different understanding. And some of it wouldn't, would be based on how are we looking at Genesis chapter 1? Are we looking at it like a, a scientific textbook giving us a historical account is, is this a video recording as you know as were a video recording of what happened or something else going on there and, and so an, another common view uh, other than the six-day view is called a literary view where we notice a very uh, obvious pairing of how days one through three fit with verse uh, days four through six so day one light is created and day four, five, and uh, day four, the sun, moon, and stars are created. Day two, the land and sky. Day five, the sea creatures and birds. Day three, the land and vegetation. Day six, the land animals. So there's an obvious pairing there. Um, and there's this, it's not quite poetry, but it's very exalted prose, the way it sounds. You know, then God said, and this happened, and 
day and evening, day one, and then God said. And so there's this, this very clear um, way of expressing things in Genesis chapter one, which some people have trouble, like how does Genesis one and Genesis two fit together? Um, and what's interesting is that other places in the Bible where we have two accounts of the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, a more figurative account and a more literal account. For right. example, in Exodus 14, we have the literal crossing of the Red Sea. Exodus chapter, Exodus 14. Exodus 15, we have the song of Deborah, uh, of uh, Moses and Miriam singing about it. And one of the things they sing is the horse and rider were cast into the sea. Well, that didn't literally happen. The horse and rider weren't thrown into the sea. The sea swallowed them up. Mm -hmm. um, but in, when you're speaking poetically, mm -hmm. you don't say things necessarily like it was a, it's a scientific you know, lab report. The same with, uh, with when Barak and Sisera uh, uh, defeat, uh, I can't remember who they defeat, in uh, Judges chapter 4, uh, you know, that ends with Jael sticking the, uh, the, um, the, the tent peg, right? Uh, and uh, that's, I guess that's Barak defeating Sisera. And then in the next chapter, Judges 5, there's a song about it. Well, if you read the song, it doesn't sound exactly like the battle. It's this, you know, celebratory thing. So some scholars have wondered, is that what's happening in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2? Um, and I find that to be somewhat compelling. Um, and they would say, so when is the beginning of the earth? We don't know, but the Bible doesn't really say it happened so many years ago. It's, we're getting this figurative description in, ch in Genesis chapter 1, or, or a little bit more figurative, and then a more literal account in Genesis chapter 2. So, so that's another view. That Again, you know, Bible-believing people who don't believe in secular, you know, not, uh, atheistic evolution. I mean, th they believe God created the world and they're just wrestling with what that text is actually mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. Any other viewpoints, gentlemen? I think for me, the biggest thing to take away, depending on where you're at in your journey with following Jesus, because there might be some people who are hung up at the beginning going, well, was it six days? Was it, you know, 10,000 years? How long did this thing really take to create? The, the first thing to come to is that God did create it. Mm -hmm. and, and just having that agreement and that understanding. And if it was in six days, that he, he had the power to do it in six days. Or if it was in 10,000 years, he had a purpose for why it took so long, but it wasn't that his power was limited by the amount of time. And so just having this just basic understanding, who created the earth? God. It wasn't created on accident. It was purposeful as we see laid out in the book of Genesis. So just having that in mind. No big bang effect. No big bang effect. Mm -hmm. My take on all of it is I just as soon agree with God when he said it was good. Yeah. Okay, man, I just okay. love the fact that this earth is good and that you have people and you have food to eat and you have this awesome creation and it's just good. And I think we should focus more on that on, than on things that we can't figure out. Okay. So God is good, the earth is good, on we go for Jesus. All right, let's go on. Um, another viewer question here. Uh, this viewer says, I was invited to a church music conference and at this conference, the speaker said, drum beats are satanic and should not be used in a church setting. However, I find a lot of drums in churches. The viewer goes on to say, why would this speaker say something like this? Or are many churches misled in what they are doing with all the drums all over the place? Well, I can tell you that drum beat is evil. It is, is it evil <laughs> because I've heard it in the jungles of Haiti where you'll hear this satanic drum beat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there, are, there, are there jungle, satanic jungle beats in the United States? Well, I don't know, but I've heard, well, yes, is the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, it Can could you be. Be, be, be descri as descriptive about it, what, what do you mean? So where do you think drum beats are evil in the United States? Well, no, no, I'm asking, in churches, in churches. Oh, I, in churches. In churches. Oh, well, I'm, it's a condition of the heart. I believe it's a condition of the heart. It's real important that the drums are not the predominant focus of mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. But no, God can use drums for his glory. It happens all the time. And he talks about drums right. and uh, there is dancing and the like. There's indication that there is a beat. I yeah. don't understand why. A timbrel is kind of like a little drum, yes, and they use that's mentioned yeah. in the Bible. High sounding cymbals. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's Psalm 100. 
verse, I thought it was Psalm 150, verses 3 through 5, because there are different classifications for, for instruments, but one common classification is there, there are woodwinds, their strings, and their percussive instruments, mm -hmm. like drums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all three of them show up in Psalm 150. Praise him with the trumpet, woodwind. Praise him with the harp and lyre, that's a stringed instrument. Praise him with the timbrel, or tambourine, or drum, or it's mm -hmm. percussive, mm -hmm. and dancing. It's just a beat. Right. It's just a beat. Praise him with stringed instruments, with pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals, percussion again. So it seems like all could be used for his glory, and all could yeah, obviously yeah. be used for evil. And I wonder if the question, you know, they ask, well, why would the speaker say something like this? It, it does seem like what can happen with any, any of the instruments is the instrumentation can so overpower mm -hmm. the worship, yeah. and, and drums can probably do that easier than other instruments. Mm -hmm. But I've been in churches where I've heard plenty of blaring guitars, where you, yeah. know, so <laughs> well, you, where you can't hear people sing. Yeah. And, and th that does seem to be a principle in, in mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.19 says, to, to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. So in our worship, our worship isn't just to be up to the Lord vertically, it's to be horizontally to others. Yeah. And if the music is so overpowering, I can't hear, maybe I can't even hear myself sing, much less the people around me, that, that's probably, or could be, what this person at the conference was getting at and why they were being so negative about drums. And if, and if it's all in balance, then you are worshiping him by playing those instruments as much as you are verbally, Absolutely. Are, are, are you Absolutely. not? It's all we have a drum player at our church, and my wife says every time he plays the drums, you can tell he is just, yeah. he's just he's just got this joyful look on his face. He's just exuding the joy of the Lord. He's playing drums yeah. to the glory of God. Yeah. I, as a teenager, I played guitar in the church for a number of years, and just enjoyed enjoyed it immensely. And and was, I knew I was worshiping mm -hmm. the Lord mm -hmm. through that instrument. Yep. Uh, yep. You know. But but I think. We want to be careful that when you say the drums are satanic, that you're taking away a part of what God wants you to use to worship Him. Right. And you're labeling it just evil. Mm -hmm. Across uh, the board. Across, yeah, across, across the board. That's what I was looking for. Across the board. You can't, you can't do that. Well, yeah, because uh, uh, it, as Neil said, it's a matter of the heart. Oh. And, and, Very good, Neil. And uh, uh, Jeremiah tells us that the heart is wicked above all uh, everything, and desperately and so wicked, yeah. desperately wicked, and so uh, we have that uh, heart problem already existent in us, and uh, that has to be overcome. The only overcomer that we have is Jesus. Uh, he uh, he takes care. He heals our heart, and uh, he uses that to uh, then heal everything about us. So. Mm -hmm. It's important for us to recognize that uh, that uh, the anything can be used for evil. Mm -hmm. It can also be used for good, and yeah. I think that's important for us to understand. Very good, very good. Well, it's break time. We've got to take a quick break, and we're coming back, and we'll discuss another important topic that our viewers have brought to our attention. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back, and uh, you can hear the discussion continues on even during the break. We're having a great time here. Certainly hope you're having a great time, too. This is another qu uh, question from our viewing audience. I grew up in a denominational church where all pastors went to seminary and were ordained. But as an adult, I am discovering that not all churches require this type of education. Is it okay to attend a church where the, pastors, or where the pastor hasn't been trained at a seminary? How sayest thou, gentlemen? Any of you ordained? Any of you from the, the product of a seminary or what? Why don't you very, just mention? I was blessed to go to a seminary. It was a great honor, a great gift from the Lord and from my wife's hard work to get <laughs> me through seminary. Uh, but certainly not. I mean, most pastors in the world and through the history of the church have not been to seminary. Really, the issue is, does the pastor know the word? And there are there's a Sunday school teacher we have at our church totally self-taught, self-schooled. He knows the Bible very, very well. 
Uh, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself as a workman who's approved, who knows how to rightly handle God's word. So mm -hmm. that's the issue. Do, does the person know how to handle God's word? Mm -hmm. And seminary certainly helps, helped me tremendously, but it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, I've been to seminary as well, and I think it has the potential to be something absolutely amazing and really, really helpful. Um, but I don't know that it made me feel like I was any more qualified to teach God's word than the calling that I felt like God put on my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as many success stories as there are through seminary, and there are so many, there are also some who aren't quite as successful and they actually come out of seminary with either a lackluster faith or they come out rejecting it altogether because of what happened there wasn't exactly helpful. Wow. And so what I would argue is just like we talked about last week when somebody asked, is it okay if I leave my church because I don't like my pastor's style? The same way when you're selecting a, you know, a church that you're gonna go to, I would choose substance over style, like constantly yes. look for that substance. And so if somebody has Excellent. this devotion to God's word, then it doesn't necessarily matter if they were trained at some world-class seminary. Mm -hmm. What matters is that God's put a calling on their life. Pastor Neil, what do you think? All those classes were helpful. I learned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me this question one time, would you trade your education for your experience in life? Ah, ah interesting. And, interesting question. And as I thought about that, I had to answer that I, I would give up the education before I gave up the experience. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that was even a fair question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I want both. <laughs> yeah, both is best, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. is best. But there's a lot to be said for experience. That's another way you mentioned last week about you can gain wisdom. Uh, knowledge is wisdom gained through experience. So that's a hard question. Uh, I think the number one thing is, is anytime you go to a church, you should seek the Holy Spirit. That should be your first qualifier. Am I sensing the presence of the Spirit in this uh, gathering of people? Good. And that might be a secondary question mm -hmm. if the pastor had been to a seminary or not. Okay. Pastor Lamb, what do you think? Well, a seminary you know, or no? Um, I have not been to seminary. I started reading the Bible when I was 19, and I've been reading it quite a bit ever since. Um, as, and along the way, I had opportunity to learn history and theology and and different things through different sources, not not through any kind of uh, uh, school setting or anything like that. I just, I had the opportunity, I learned what I learned, and, um, uh, and I, I've been at the church uh, for 12 years, and they seem to like me, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what young. to say. I mean, you know, I, uh, I'm still uh, preaching the gospel. I, uh, I preach the pure, unadulterated word and, uh, um, and try to uh, give them the truth every day. Excellent. That's A lot of people do. call that being self-taught. Other people call that being Holy Spirit taught. Ah, yeah. A lot of great f church fathers didn't have seminary. So they, they were taught by the Spirit and we can be too. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the uh, next question we have here. I want to create a booklet of verses for a friend who is going through cancer. Can you offer suggestions on what verses you would include? A book on cancer to help somebody deal with cancer. And what As I mentioned earlier, there's already a lot of, lot of books like that out there uh, that you can find. My wife passed away from cancer a long time ago, and I still remember it just like it was yesterday. Hmm. And at that time, God brought me to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, it's been a scripture that I depend on. Uh, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. So when you're in that cancer situation with someone that you love and you'd rather die than them, mm. uh, it's really, really difficult. And I had to just keep remembering that, that God's, God's in charge. Mm -hmm. God's mm -hmm. in charge. Mm -hmm. I lost my wife 19 months ago of COVID. Um, and then 26 years ago, I lost my first wife um, due to brain aneurysm. 
And in both times, it, it forced me to depend on God. Yeah. Amen. And I mean that in a positive manner. Yeah. It forced me to do so. And I became married to him. And even to this day, as I sit here, it's his comfort that helps me. When, yeah. when I get up in the morning and I'm in that house all by myself, you know, I, I, think, I think about what comfort he is bringing to me. I can feel it. I feel the comfort. And I need it. Believe me, I do. So it's... Um, I, what can I say? It, it's just, it's just. Rick helpful. mentioned before that you grow through trials and tribulations. Yeah, yeah. And that whole time for me, for for her, she went to heaven. Yes. yes. Good deal. Same here. For yeah. me, it was the most severe pruning process I ever experienced in my mm. life. Mm -hmm. It taught me to trust God and do my best, and then trust God for the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are there any other scriptures that you could come up with that you think would help this viewer that well, provides this I, question? Um, when I'm reading for uh, someone that is, um, you know, next in line, as it were, I like Revelation 22, 2. Uh, Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding the fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the, of the nations. Nation. And, uh, and certainly when we cross from death to life, uh, eternal life, uh, we are healed. And so uh, the tree of life is healing them at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, until then, it's always nice to hear about it before we get there. So. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it is. Any other verses of scripture that you care to add? Anybody? Uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Uh -huh. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, it's not necessarily a promise that your plight is going to go away, mm -hmm. but it is a promise that God will be with you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's so valuable that no matter what we're facing, whether it's a illness or a job loss, depending on whatever it could be, that our focus is on God and continually praying and seeking Him. Mm -hmm. My favorite verse, I have it actually up on my wall in my office, is Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yeah. So if I live on in this life, Christ is going to sustain me and help me. If I die, life's actually better for me on the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think too of, um, of Matthew chapter 10, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? yet not one falls to the ground apart from the will of your father and the hairs of your head are numbered and you are worth far more than many uh, birds. And so this, this idea that God cares, God knows, God sees, uh, because yeah, we don't want the easy believe like, oh, just trust the Lord, it's gonna be okay. That's not necessarily true. Uh, trust in the Lord because he's gonna take care of you in life or in death. That's a much more comforting thought. That's great. It's really important to give people scripture I've found out it's more important to give them, not more important, but it's at least equally important to give them you. So yes. be there, be yeah. there yeah. with that person. And sometimes I find that just your presence there, even if you don't say anything, right. your presence speaks volumes, does it not? Yes, absolutely. My mother one time, we had a tragedy happened in our community to a young child was injured and it was my best friend's uh, responsibility. And my mother went to the hospital and she sat there with him for two hours. And, and years later, he told me that that was the most important time of his life that my mother was there with him. And I said, what did she say? And she, he said, she didn't say anything. Mm. Yeah, yeah, wow. All right, well, I hope those verses will help someone out there that wrote this question. Uh, another question um, from a viewer. Is it okay to pray for evil people to die. <laughs> Is it okay to pray for evil people to die? What sayest thou, gentlemen? My first thought on that was, is there's probably a lot better things to pray than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought, too. I, I thought you could pray for their repentance. Uh, uh, Proverbs 21 1 says, God, the king's heart are like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns them wherever he wants. So, Lord, cause this person to repent. Uh, we could pray for their evil plans to be thwarted. 
Uh, Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 10, break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Psalm 59, break the teeth in their mouth. Um, so yeah, there are other things we could pray um, before, before we get to praying for their death. And, and perhaps maybe I could see at some point some especially wicked person um, who's continuing on in their evil and you think they're, doing, they're causing all sorts of harm. I think the Lord's Prayer, uh, may your kingdom come. If this person is doing something that's just so hateful and pushing against God's kingdom so much, like, Lord, I want your kingdom to come. So take them out of the way so your kingdom can advance. But wow, that's, that's not my next door neighbor who's annoying me. I mean, you know, <laughs> this, this is Hitler kind of person. So I'm not sure I'd ever be comfortable praying a prayer like that, but I, I'm not sure I could necessarily say it's wrong yeah, in we, all situations. I think we have to filter everything we do through the heart of God and the character of mm -hmm. God and his desires that none should perish. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that our goal should be that somebody is able to finish their life before accepting yeah. mm -hmm. Jesus as their savior. We don't want anyone to go to hell, right? We don't want anyone to be separated, period. I, th I think that the catch, the, the key rather, the key yeah. phrase that you said is to, to run everything by God. Yes. When you, that, that, that's the key. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I might jump out there and say, God, if it's within your will, <laughs> for that person to die. Yeah. Wow. And, and I guess the, the for the most part, the opportunity for a person to consider whether he wants to pray for a person to die is, is there mass destruction going on? Are a lot of people being affected by what this man is doing? And that's why we should pray for his death as opposed to you you know, somebody stepping on your toe when you right. want. Yeah. Right. You Have you ever noticed that when some evil person gets taken out of the scene, that they get replaced by yeah, another right. evil person? Yeah. Yeah. Right. We see with Paul, though, uh, he, was, he was actively warring against the church of God, and God turned him from an enemy right. to a friend. And yeah. more than a friend, he became one of the great apostles right. that uh, transformed the world as we know it. So um, I, I think that a better prayer would be praying for them to come to salvation. All right. And on, on that note, we're going to have to end it. We want to thank you very much for uh, all the contributions you've made to the program today and last week, of course. And uh, certainly we, we pray that someone has been helped out there in our audience by our discussions today and it's really up to you now to go before God and to make it all happen and using your faith. Thank you for being with us and of course our program Live Questions airs every week at this time so be sure to tune in again next week at the same time and for this panel of fine ministers and for TV44 I'm Bill Harris we want to thank you for being with us. Bye bye. <music>